mushrooms have a remarkable adaptogenic flexible character right they grow everywhere but they can also grow on things that are rotten on things that are dead on things that are, don't have a use so they have a cleaning effect so they adjust themselves they are much easier for the body to adjust to than herbs and you don't develop tolerance to them Hey everybody, welcome to this week's show. Today I have Dr. Isaac Elias. He's a medical doctor and a licensed acupunctural therapist on the program today. He's a formulator, he's a clinician, he's a researcher, and we are gonna talk about detoxification today. We'll also talk about conditions like autoimmune disease, cancer, and cleansing and detoxifying your body. And what's really unique about Dr. Isaac is he started off in more of a Western approach and then started following more ancient Asian medicine in order to help people get healthy. So, so excited to talk to him today. Dr. Isaac, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, cool. Well, hey, I'm, I'm excited to talk to you. I started looking through your website and reading up more about you and was just really impressed about your background and sort of the mindset you have. I thought, saw you were talking about, you know, medicinal mushrooms, which I'm a big fan of. You talked about ancient herbs and spices for healing and also reducing stress, which I know is so important for people, which we'll talk about today. But one of the first things I want to dive into and ask you about is sort of what caused you to start focusing more on this holistic natural model and move away from a lot of the conventional, uh, you know, c- conventional uh, system we have today. So uh, it's a, I have to make a small correction. I started my journey with healing at the age 15. Wow. I, I lived in Korea. I practiced Taekwondo with the Korean national team because they had to learn English and yoga. So I was a yoga teacher when I went to medical school. So I went to medical school knowing that I will never do conventional medicine. Wow. But I still had to do it, you know. During the day, I w- when the professor would ask, what do you give for ulcerative colitis? And I would say 60 milligram prednisone. And he says, yes. And I never prescribed it in my life. And so I already was studying Chinese medicine parallel to studying Western medicine. I was teaching yoga therapy, doing shiatsu. And so I really integrated both worlds from a very early age. And into it, I always had meditation and healing practice as part of it. So my journey really is about 45 years later now, I'm in my early 60s. And through this time of you know, getting a Master of Science in Chinese Medicine, becoming a licensed acupuncturist, becoming a trained classical homeopath, but also finding the importance of connecting the mind and body, I developed pretty powerful tools that I focused on integrative oncology, where I really integrate research. You know, I have an NIH grants. I published a double-blind clinical trials with Harvard. Yet in the same time, I hold a holistic approach. And I find that the more you can do it, and I think you can relate to it, the more simple tools will be enough. You know, the more our medicine is refined, the more understanding of what health means, the more we can create a change, each of us in our own life and in the life of others. Wow, I love that. It's powerful. And I love that you were able to go to get the degree you had to get, which is something a lot of people have to do. But then at the entire time you were educating yourself, you were learning more about these uh, ancient forms of medicine and ancient remedies, which I love. Let's go ahead and dive in and start talking about toxicity, because I know this is something that's on your heart. It's something you're passionate about is I've heard you discuss and and read you, uh, you, you seen some of your writings on how toxins affect our body. Share with that everybody. What are how do toxins affect our body? What are some of our big and what are some of our biggest toxic exposures we all need to be aware of? Right. So this is a huge topic that is growing, and there are really some basic categories of toxins. So we have the heavy metal realms, lead, you know, that comes from coal, that comes from from pollutants, that comes from from airplanes, uh, mercury, of course, that is present in different places and then cadmium, nickel, and all the positively charged heavy metals, including uranium, cesium, some of the radioactive elements. So this is one category that causes DNA damage, that affects our enzymatic processes, it affects our microbiome. Then we've got the category of pesticides. And pesticides are a huge issue. It's kind of mind-blowing. You know, as of 2012, in the United States, 1.1 billion pounds of pesticides a year. 
80% of them are glyphosate. Now probably more like 1.5. So Josh, one out of each of us gets five pounds of pesticides a year in the ground. The problem is that it accumulates. It by accumulates. You know, you look at research from Israel, for example, where DDT was uh, became illegal in the 60s. You can still find DDT in the in the in the in the fatty tissue of breast cancer 50 years later because it bioaccumulates. So pesticides affects our gut integrity. You know, glyphosate is leading affects our our nervous system, causing neuroinflammation, causes chronic kidney disease, causes cancer. So these are two very large categories. Then we got all the radiation exposure, ionizing radiation from scans, from cosmic radiation, and EMF. And also some of this radiation may not be directly ionizing, so scientists will say it doesn't damage your, your DNA. It creates stress on the extracellular matrix, stress on the membrane. And the body responds with a survival response. It wants to survive. How does it respond? With microinflammation. And that's a lot of my research on Galactin 3, which we hopefully we'll talk later, and about creating the microenvironment. So that's one level of toxicity. But then what about lifestyle toxicity? Everybody is stressed. We live an inflammatory lifestyle. If we don't respond to a, to, a, to a text or a WhatsApp in two minutes, you know, people think something happened. When things move very fast, they cause inflammation. And then we got emotional toxicity. The tension, the divisiveness, anger, resentment. We lost the sense of community, of belonging. So we are losing our natural de uh, detox system. And the biggest one is just being in nature. But now nature that provides us clean air and clean water is not as clean anymore. So this all creates a very big problematic picture, but I wouldn't mention it to you if there were no solutions. The idea that there are solutions for all of this. Otherwise, what's the point of complaining about it? <laughs> yeah, it's so true. I love, I love that you're coming with solutions. We're going to dive into those, some of those strategies here as well. Um, you know, one of the things I've also seen you mention, though, is that we have these environmental toxins, but we also have these emotional toxins, right, that affect our organ systems. Talk to me about what are some of the most prevalent emotional toxins and how do those specifically affect our organ systems? Wow, what a question. I've literally, I'm not exaggerating, I spent decades studying this and refining a treatment for this. So from a classical point of Chinese medicine, Certain emotions affect certain organs. For example, anger and resentment affect the liver and gallbladder, and uh, fear and overambition and drive affect the kidneys, and uh, obsessiveness and worry affect the digestive system, and grief affects the lung. We can feel when we are said how our lungs constrict. But it's not only the emotion, it's how we respond to the emotion. You know, if somebody upsets us, we respond with getting angry. But this anger creates changes in our nervous system, sympathetic response. It creates changes in our metabolic system. We feel threatened. And this threatening wakes up protein in our body, our alarm protein. The main one is galactin-3, which I've been researching for 25 years. So... And then it starts the whole cascade of inflammation, the whole cytokine storm. You know, you see it with the COVID now. People don't die from the virus. They die from the cytokine storm and from the kidney damage, which is driven by the same protein, galactin-3, as a survival response of the tissue. So if there is a way for us that we can react in these emotions by actually transforming them into love and compassion and healing, that's our real detoxification. You, we no longer detoxify, we transform. And it's kind of amazing that we got to it right away. There's one organ in the body that does it, and it's our heart. Every organ in our body, if you think about it, every cell in our body gets cleaned blood, right, with nourishment and releases waste material. The only organ in the body that takes in dirty blood, venous blood, connects with the universe, detoxifies through the universe, gets nourishment, and gives clean blood and nourishment, is the heart. So the heart is our big transformer. And it's so beautiful because you ask for it, 
The heart doesn't take care of himself in a selfish way. The heart nourishes itself as part of nourishing others. What do I mean? Only when it's done and the blood goes out of the aorta, that's when it gives itself blood through the coronary artery. So from this perspective, Josh, self-love that comes from the heart is part of loving of others. It's a part of belonging to a community. It's belong, and that's the real healing. That's the lesson right now. You know, we are sitting right now in this very you know, turbulent time and we all respond, you know, we all react. So it's changing reactivity to the responsiveness of an open heart. And the crazy thing, it's built in each of us. Yeah, you know, Dr. Isaac, I know you and I both feel the same way. In fact, a lot of what you just mentioned is stuff that I've, you know, uh, some of this is what I have uh, taught the audience and gone through and I've learned myself. And I know it's transformed the way that I look at what health is and it's so much more than body it's mind and spirit right and okay. so you know i um i really appreciate you diving into this and your wisdom there and i think too it's important for everybody to recognize for and i think you'd agree with this is that health in fact your emotional health if you're saying you know if you're com- saying what's more important what you eat or the emotions you experience i would say the emotion your emotional health in a way trumps it most of the time i mean it is that big of a difference to you know, preventing a heart attack, preventing cancer, preventing diabetes is your emotional state. And you may not agree with that, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on how, just how important that is. Wow, you know, I mean, this is, this is great. I cannot agree enough. You know, part of what I do, I didn't mention, I've been fortunate for 30 years to study with the greatest uh, meditation masters in Asia and Tibet and be their doctors. So I was very privileged to get very unique training in meditation and transform it into healing. So I actually, I teach it on a volunteer basis a lot in Israel. I create a meditation and healing environment when we work on these things, when you create a healthy diet and exercise, but we work on opening our heart. And you know, you can see objectively in three, four days, cancer markers getting better. You can see traumas going away because it's very important to eat well, but that's the more coarse way of doing things. But what drives us to not eat well? What drives us to do what we do? It's our emotions, in our psychology, it's our traumas. And some of it is ours, and some of it is registered in our body from previous generation through genetic scars and epigenetic scars. And we know if you even do one hour of yoga, 100 genes turn on and off in one hour. So what you're saying, not only I agree with it, I can't agree with it enough. And when I talk about detoxification, I emphasize it in the preparation phase. What do we want to get rid of? It's not only toxins. It's we can get rid of emotions. We can get rid of traumas. We can get rid of negative habits. So we can connect with our heart and with ourselves. So this is really why detoxification can be so profound as a healing tool beyond just focusing on the on the, on the on the substance which is which is vital but it's really just a tool for what you were talking about yeah so we are totally in sync about it absolutely i love that doc you know one of the things i know that you're going to talk about as well we're going to dive into now is what is the strategy for detoxification i think one of the things that i think that you do so well is going through you know, a multi-stage approach, because it's not just, hey, take this one supplement or cut this one thing out. There are things that need to happen. So what are some of the ways or stages that somebody needs to go through to fully detoxify their body from, you know, from all these things we're exposing ourselves to from, you know, 5G to genetically modified foods to environmental pollutants and everything else, mercury, all, all of these things. Right. So I think when we look at detoxification, there are two levels of detoxification. There is an ongoing detoxification that happens all the time. Every time we exhale, we detoxify. And for this, all the lifestyle changes that you talk a lot about and I talk makes a big difference. And then there is an active engagement in detoxification, which is ideally done in the time when nature changes, in the spring and in the fall. That's ideally the end. So before we dive into detoxification, like you say, just taking a supplement, the first stage is the preparation stage. We prepare ourselves. We prepare ourselves physically. 
by starting to eat a cleaner diet, higher in greens, higher in fiber, lighter, we prepare ourselves emotionally by thinking what emotions we want to get rid of. We prepare ourselves psychologically, mentally, what habits we want to change. Because many of those are books and books about detox like this or like that. But you don't often hear a discussion about what is detoxification? What are we trying to detoxify? So when we have a preparation and we have ourselves set up on the point of view of physical preparation, preparation from an energy point of view and emotional, psychological preparations, our body gets a message. This is what we want to do. And then we, the basic part of detoxification and the secret is the combining exposure with binding. We all want to, to survive. You know, it's a topic I'm finally writing a book after decades, and it's called The Survival Paradox. Because our survival response is going to come in two months, two, three months. Our survival response is a paradox because it's what causes us to get sick. So when we get toxins, the body needs to deal with it. So it deals with it by burying it in certain tissues that are not very active, like fatty tissues. Or it's isolated in a certain organ, and supposedly the body doesn't see it, and one day we wake up with cancer. So now that we are detoxifying, we expose the toxins. And we expose it by breaking the microenvironment, by breaking the biofilm, by breaking what we call the lattice formation. The lattice formation, the coating that creates microenvironment is a scientific term, is made from, from many, many specific proteins called galactin-3, which are carbohydrate binding proteins that bind together with other inflammatory and sticky molecules and create an isolation. So when we expose, People ask me, what is exposure? Exposure is like throwing everything out of your kitchen drawers on the floor. We need to bind it. We got to bind it. And so we always have to integrate binders into our detox, both on the gut level and systemically. And the leading, leading binder with no competition, in my opinion, the most important supplement one has to take is modified citrus pectin. And the reason? It's, it blocks galactin-3. It stops the process of inflammation, of fibrosis, and in the same time, it binds to heavy metal. Everything is published. There are close to 70 published papers on my specific and modified citrus pectin. So when we have the exposure and the binding, now we are in safe environment. And then we focus on the concept of discharge and elimination. We discharge the, the toxins from the tissue, the phase one of liver detoxification, and we need the different minerals and vitamins. And then we eliminate through the elimination organs, through, you know, through our gut, through our urination, through our lungs, through our skin. And we have to support this process. So infrared sauna, exercise, oxygen, and uh, uh, high, high fibers. And we have to realize detoxification this is very brief, of course. I often teach seminars of a few days on detoxification. When we detoxify, it's a catabolic process. We need to provide the body with energy and with support. We need to bring, give the body good circulation. We need to give the body good energy, mitochondrial support. So there are certain adaptogenic herbs that specifically will support detox through adaptogenic process. Herb-wise, the classical one is astragalus. Wang Chi, and this is where the medicinal mushrooms come into play. Medicinal mushrooms have both an adaptogenic quality and they have an affinity to toxic area, right? We use them to, cre to create, dead, to eat up dead material. And then we really have to respect our microbiome. We got to respect our relationship with the microbiome and really understand how there is a synchronistic, synergistic effect. And this is where we use prebiotics and probiotics. So this is a, this is a very quick, you know, general uh, over, overview. Maybe I'll add one point before we dive deeper, deeper into it. We've got to be aware of glyphosate and pesticides. I've overlooked it for many years. So we got to support the gut lining. So it means 
using some binders even at a higher molecular weight, like alginates. That's why I combine MCP alginates. And I have a lot of published papers. Everything I'm mentioning, I've actually got to published research papers on. And we can use glycine, which, 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 uh, which supports and protects the gut lining and reduces the absorption of, of glyphosate. So this is, and when we look at this, and there can be some more gut support. And when we look at this, this is the basic principles of detoxification. And of course, like you asked before, in each stage of detoxification, different emotions will come up, different feelings. And so there's a very intricate way of balancing it. But when you follow these principles and you always combine modified citrus pectin, medicinal mushrooms, and uh, alginates into the process, you do not see the crises of detoxification. You actually detoxify and you feel good. And I've, I've done it for decades now. I love it, Doc. These are great recommendations. I just want to uh, mention this to everybody listening. So uh, Dr. Isaac here has talked about pectin or modified pectin specifically. And I do want to mention just something about pectin for a minute. Pectin is a naturally occurring compound right. found in foods. They're just uh, essentially shortening it to make it, it more highly absorbable by the body. A few of the foods that are naturally occurring in pectin, apples uh, have pectin, guava, pears, plums, and citrus fruits have quite a bit of pectin, but specifically it's the peel. Citrus peels like orange peel have been used in ancient Chinese medicine for thousands of years to support lymphatic drainage and supporting right. detoxification and digestion of the body. So I just wanted to say the thing I love about Dr. Isaac here, he's talking about the latest research, but he's also talking about how this is used historically for thousands of years for digestion and detoxification. He also mentioned, well, you guys probably know this, one of my five favorite herbs on the planet, and that is astragalus. Astragalus is an adaptogen for your digestive system. It has immune boosting properties, another powerful one there. And so anyways, Dr. Isaac, I love, I love what you're sharing here. It's powerful information for detoxification, but also, you know, good for uh, digestion, elimination, and other things. Definitely. You know, the modified citrus pectin is a very specific modification because it's a generic term. So the, the, all the research is done on a very specific uh, modified citrus pectin that I developed. I mean, I, I disclosed it called pectasol, you know, because we create a very specific structure that allows, we have shown with antibodies, it allows to get absorbed into the system and it has its unique bi biological effect. But as you said, it's derived from pectin. It's really nature's gift. So it addresses, it addresses this survival response from a substance point of view. And, uh, and in the same time, we have all the other components that allows us, because really, it's really what causes us aging and disease is either an, an excessive inflammatory response or excessive fibrotic response. And this is really balanced. This is really driven by this one, one protein. So what you see, for example, in Lyme disease patients, the Borrelia is, is hidden under the biofilm, under this shield that can have, uh, can have lipids, can have protein, but these are glycolipids, glycoproteins. And what's happening is that they are all sitting on the structure of galactin-3. So when you break it, you allow the body to clean up the mess. And we see the same effects, not only in detox, we see it in cancers. You know, I weigh a lot, and we're just about to publish a multi-center trial on prostate cancer with remarkable results, our third published papers. So the same concept that helps detoxification will help to promote our health in so many different ways. So doc, talk to me about biofilms, because that's one of the issues here with cancer, right? Is that we get these you know, uh, breaking up biofilms in the body. And I also want to hear about a little bit about, you know, talking about your uh, protocols for fighting cancer. We know this modified pectin is a form. Talk to me about biofilms and how we really eliminate and why, why are biofilms a problem and what are they? Right. So really, biofilms are really sticky barriers that can form around toxins, around pathogens, around tumors. They can even, you can look at an arteriosclerotic plaque as a biofilm, you know, it's an isolated environment, right, made out of fats. But if we really look at them, so of course they are, we talk a lot about them in the gut, 
that it's a way that, bi that the microbiome creates its own safety network and it has a relationship with the body. But if we, if we stress the biofilm, if we stress the microbiome with antibiotics or, we, or other ways, it responds by creating excessive biofilm and, and find its way to penetrate into the gut. But the same thing happens systemically. And what it creates, it creates, it creates microenvironment. What do I mean? Environment that behave different chemically and biochemically. And it actually creates something called a lattice formation, a coating. And the coating is made out of galactin-3. Five galactin-3 is attached to each other. And each, and there's a place that they attach <coughs> through different inflammatory proteins <coughs> that bring back, that suppress the immune system, that bring inflammation, that allows tumors to stick together. And what happened then, the cancer has its own, its own hypoxic environment. There's no oxygen. So what happens? It turns into aerobic glycolysis. It uses glycolysis even if the whole body has oxygen. That's how you get cancer developing. You get acidosis. And this creates many different chronic diseases. <clears throat> so the idea is once we break it, we allow our body to respond. So what we see, for example, in biochemically recurrent prostate cancer, it's a great example. So somebody has prostate cancer, the, can, the prostate cancer is taken out locally, there is no prostate cancer. PSA starts coming back, which means the, can, the prostate cancer is starting to come back locally because there was no PSA, prostate was taken out. The body can't respond. Why it can't respond? Because of the inflammation, because of the biofilm that, uh, in simple language, created from the cancer and from the procedure. You give our modified citrospectin, we are now publishing a paper with 80% response. 80% of the people, it slowed down, stopped, or improved the cancer. How is it possible? Not because it killed it directly. It allowed the body to do its job. And that's why these approaches are not alternative. They are complementary. They are integrative. For example, galactin-3 will inhibit the PDL1 immune therapies in cancer, the most important cutting edge therapies. So if you block galactin 3, you'll get a better response to, to, to immunotherapy. So it's really a wave of the future. You know, I, when I started this in 95, <coughs> people would often, uh, you know, as they say, first they ridicule you, then they fight you, and then they say it's self evident. So now we're at the self evident phase when everybody recognizes it and everybody is researching it. It was a 25 years overnight success, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah. I love that. And I love that quote, by the way. It's, uh, you know, so true for so many things we've seen, obviously, throughout history, including, you know, it's funny because, you know, the, the, the medical system, first off, you know, ancient Asian medicine has been using, you know, astragalus and ginseng and uh, right. medicinal mushrooms like reishi for thousands of years. And then all of a sudden, the, you know, the past 100 years or in certain periods throughout history, it's like, oh... We don't know if this actually works. And, that, and then now in the past 20 years, it's like, wow, this stuff is so powerful again. But, you know, you and I have known the whole time we've been saying, oh. hey, this stuff is not only proven throughout history, it's been proven by all of the medical science. It's non-biased today. I, want, I, I love that you've talked about some of these remedies. You talked about uh, the modified citrus pectin. You talked about astragalus. You've talked about some of the other ways to detoxify. Talk to me a little bit about medicinal mushrooms. This is one of the things I read about in your website. I saw you had some really uh, fantastic uh, you know, quotes in terms of research and what it does. Well, what is it that makes mushrooms so powerful and who should be using uh, mushrooms and what are some of your favorite types of medicinal mushrooms? So mushrooms should really be part of our daily regimen, especially these days with the, with the pandemic going on. Mushrooms have a remarkable adaptogenic, flexible character, right? They grow everywhere, but they can also grow on things that are rotten, on things that are dead, on things that are, don't have a use, so they have a cleaning effect. So they adjust themselves. They are much easier for the body to adjust to th than herbs, and you don't develop tolerance to them. Now, for example, I use my specific medicinal mushroom formula that I grow on that I grow on medicinal herbs. I actually grow the mushrooms on herbs. And you know, and for me personally, my experience, I haven't had the flu for over 20 years, but it does something to you. So what are my favorite mushrooms? So mushrooms have a unique 
quality based on their structure and chemistry, which I won't go in detail. They can affect our past. What do I mean? They help us to clean toxins. They help us. So for example, if you, if you had hepatitis and you take reishi, your chances of getting cirrhosis and, and long-term liver damage are smaller. There are mushrooms that help your immediate immune response. Coriolis versicolor is the leading one. And there are mushrooms that train us for the future. They train our immune system. So when you use mushrooms, you want to use a combination that addresses our past, addresses our present, and addresses our future, which is very much an Asian medicine philosophy. So my favorite mushroom from the point of view of, of brain support and cardiac support are reishi and cordyceps, dong tsong si atsao. Uh, tremella also is very good for the lung, uh, uh, by white, white, white wood ear. Then you have digestive mushrooms that are, that are very important. For the stomach, it's more heresium, for the digestive itself, it's, it's poria coccus. You have mushrooms that have a relationship between the digestion and the liver, maitake and shiitake. Maitake is more the addition between the digestion and the liver. Shiitake between the liver and the digestion. And then you have polyporous, it supports the urinary system, the OBGYN system. And, and, then, you, and then you have auricularia that support more the area of the rectum and the anus. So when you formulate, when I formulate a, a mushroom formula, like the 10 mushrooms, you will see a list of mushrooms on the label. But really, this philosophy that I explained to you is reflected in my formulations, in the dosages, in the relationship. Yeah, I, I, I really love the fact that you appreciate mushrooms. Talk to me about these mushrooms. And you mentioned one earlier, just not by this name. But talk to me about, because by the way, reishi is my favorite mushroom. It's the one that I use the most. Um, but talk to me about turkey tail, uh, lion's mane, and chaga. What are those three mushrooms good for? So lion's mane, turkey tail, and chaga. I mean, li lion's mane, again, and I usually use it, the Chinese name, lion's mane has a lot of important uh, uh, properties for, 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 the, for the liver. Turkey tail really stands out because turkey tail or Coriolis really has PSK and PSP inside, active ingredient. You know, there was a period in Japan where the extracts of this mushroom were one of the most used chemotherapy drugs. So turkey tail specifically has an ability for immediate immune response. Mm. So for example, if we have to fight a virus now, if we have to fight cancer now, so turkey tail is your biggest mushroom to use immediately together with other treatments, cancer treatments, antiviral treatments, and it has an effect, especially on the center of the body. Uh, chaga, I don't use as much. It's not part of the, of, but it has a very unique ad, uh, adaptogenic uh, abilities. And really, cordyceps is a remarkable mushroom. Mm -hmm. Because cordyceps, I had the privilege to pick cordyceps at 14,000 feet myself in the Himalayas. So anything that can grow at 14,000 feet has to be adaptogenic. There is no oxygen, right? Yep. Same thing with reishi. Reishi grows in very high altitude, less oxygen. So it has to be adaptogenic and it has to have antioxidant effects because a lot of oxidative stress, there's no proper metabolism. And it's, so that's really, I think, what resonates. I love the fact that you look at mushrooms in this way because you mentioned many companies, they just throw the ingredients because of a study they, they heard they lose the magic of the philosophical understanding. So we really want to do, look at the signature of what the mushroom symbolizes, the environment that it grows in, and then it will be translated in, into what it does in the body. It really works in this way. And from this perspective, you can say, yes, Isaac, you are, you know, you are a researcher, you, are in, you have dozens of, of, of uh, peer-reviewed papers, but I don't formulate based on research. I formulate based on this ancient understanding. I use the research to substantiate what I do. Same here. I, I love it. I love that mindset. I think it's so important. It's something that's missing today totally. in our Western, you know, in Western medicine, but also in Western 
nutrition. It's missing as well. And I think people are not getting the full benefits. They're not getting the full benefits and actually getting the root cause and using food as medicine because of it, which I think is so important. Tell me, what are some of your other favorite herbs for supporting health? Let's talk about herbs for, so what are some of your favorite herbs for three categories, your immune system, digestion and detoxification. So immune system, digestion, detoxification. So again, I, I think very much in a, in, a, in a Chinese way. So for the immune system, my favorite compounds without doubt are medicinal mushrooms. There is no competition. Yep. They are, they, there, there is no, and modified citrus pectin, which is, which is a major immune enhancer. Astragalus is your classical immune supporter. And other adaptogenic herbs, like like uh, like ginseng, uh, like uh, you know some 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 of the Ayurvedic herbs, the classical Ayurvedic herbs, and Eleutherococcus, uh, they are very big on the category of 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 of, of uh, doing this. When it comes to detox, there are a lot of herbs for supporting the liver, from as simple as milk sisal to using some of the uh, as a, what we call Wang Qin, Wang Bai, and Wang, Wang Lian, the three yellows in, uh, in, in Chinese medicine that will help the lung, the liver, and the, and the, and the urinary system. And also to help the, the discharge of the different organs. So there are different herbs that will help discharge. For example, uh, Spica uh, Prunelia, uh, Siakutsa will help to, to to discharge from the lungs, you know, uh, polyporous so will help to discharge from the from the from the bladder. So I usually combine them together as yeah. formulas. Now, how do you like? Let me give you a couple herbs that I I like using for various conditions when we talk about liver health. And oftentimes, again, they're in a formulation. I love using milk thistle. I also love using bupleurum and chisandra. How, how do you like some of those herbs, and what have you used those for? Right. So these are great herbs and they work in a very different way. Yeah. So schizandria is really, is really the, uh, is a five taste herbs. Yeah. So schizandria is an, is an astringent herb. It closes energy. So it's a great herb to use when you are detoxifying to support the body systems. What do I mean? When we detoxify, we don't want to get to lose our energy in the same time. So when I talked about, about support, Schizandria is a great example. Example, mm -hmm. Buplerum will have a tendency to detoxify the gallbladder, mm -hmm. but it's also a drying herb. So you want to make sure that you are moisturizing at the same time. So there are some moisturizing herbs in Chinese medicine that will add. Buplerum is an amazing herb, and the Buplerum formulas are magic. But you want to bring more into it is some Dangwei and some Danshen, some Salvia, just to create the moisturizing, you know, they're like, it's almost just like you pet somebody in the bed, you give them a hug, you tell them it's okay, you're going to go through the detox. Yeah. Let's, oh, yeah. let's nourish you. The Buplerum pushes, the Schizandria says we all together, you know, we, you know, hold together. And these other herbs are moisturizing and letting go. Yeah, it's, it's, I, I didn't know that you're so much into this kind of, of understanding. It's so, it's beautiful. It's incredible. We are really... I mean, I don't find many people I can talk at this level because I usually just want the research on this, the research on that. I give it to them, but well, it's that, really that was one of the reasons I was so excited to talk to you as well. Is I, I love. I mean, again, I, I've spent my entire career studying uh, Asian medicine, you know, especially traditional Chinese medicine. I've studied some Ayurveda, but my my greatest passion is Chinese medicine, so and so cool. I have well, one of my best friends here is a. Uh, a Chinese medical doctor and I acupuncturist. And so we, um, and this is the way that I, I treat people when I care for them too. So this is what, this is what I loved when I started reading through your website and finding out about you. I loved how you were treating things holistically and, uh, you know, using, you know, ancient medicine, you know, I, a question for you. I, I, uh, I told somebody this recently, I said, you know, if somebody would have gone even in certain areas of Asia today, but in ancient Asia, you would have gone into an apothecary or an ancient pharmacy. People most of the time would have, that what would have been in there would have been herbs, spices, mushrooms, and then maybe even like organ meats or glandulars. Talk to me about that. Have you ever prescribed or recommended any sort of glandular like liver or spleen or heart? Uh, and what is that role in Chinese medicine is using different organ meats and even bone broth, you know, using some of those tissues? 
Uh, this is so cool, my gosh. Yeah, of course we do it. It's it's a it's a doctrine of signatures, definitely. You know, it's even more fascinating to this. Yeah, yeah, I do this all the time, and bone broth, of course. One of my unique specialties, which is really on the cutting edge, is using therapeutic apheresis. It's a, I'm, I really I use a, which you know I'm, I I I also present in the main conference all over the world, and it's a similar to hemodialysis. We separate the cells from the from the plasma, and we filter the plasma. But I make a point to look at every filter. Why am I telling you this story? Because there is a bag where all the waste from the blood. So I have the privilege, I see the, the junk in the blood that other people don't, okay? I can diagnose the person based on the waste in their bag. You know why? It will often create the form of the organ that is sick in the body. Wow. You know, when you see it, so what you're talking is so true. So, the, so using the doctrine of signatures is so important, definitely. And you know, sometimes you will prescribe something to somebody just because of their affinity with it or the color of the herb that speaks to them. You know, we, we really, I mean, it's so exciting for me to talk to you about it because, you know, you have a big voice, keep on, and you're young, keep on mentioning it. I see, for example, naturopathy, naturopaths wants to become MDs. So everything is about research and research. Sometimes I would give a lecture and I would try and I would sit next to somebody and I would give them like, like one of my, my pearls that I traveled to a remote place in Tibet to learn. You know, when I meditated and you see, and there is no light in the eyes. Mm -hmm. Where is it? Are there any randomized control trials? Where are you to open yourself to this? So it's so, and really in my book, The Survival Paradox, it's all about this. It's a, I go into, I, it's a really a paradigm shift. And so a lot of what you're talking about, Claire, I'm writing about, but oh, am I exciting that this is important for you? I'm really excited about it. Well, I love it, Dr. Uh, Dr. Isaac as well. Again, I've loved your research. I love what, uh, you know, what you've put out there. I think it's so important. I want to uh, just encourage everybody. Um, you know, you had mentioned, I want to encourage you, check out Dr. Isaac's website. It is simply drelias.com. So dr. E L I A Z dot org. So Dr. Elias, D R E L I A Z dot org. And, you know, Doc, you've got some incredible articles, especially on fighting cancer, on improving digestion, on the power of medicinal mushrooms. You talked about the modified citrus pectin and the cancer fighting power. So if you're listening to this and you're saying, I want to boost my immune system, I want to improve my digestion, I want to, I want to detoxify my entire body, not just one organ, but really do a full body detoxification. I want to encourage you guys, check out Dr. Isaac's uh, website here, uh, org, And uh, he's got some fantastic articles on here. Also, he's got a uh, an online store you can check out there as well. But he's just got some great stuff, great research here. Um, that I love and want to say, Doc, this was, uh, man, fantastic information. Any final closing thoughts before we go on what somebody can start doing? Any simple information on, hey, what are a few things people can start doing today to help, you know, help heal their body? Wow. I think the most important thing right now is to create space, to take a few minutes. When you wake up before you jump, sit in your bed, take a few deep breaths, take a big exhalation and you let your mind and heart open until the tunnel vision becomes more open, your heart becomes more open. Do the same before you, you go to bed. Good hydration, exercise, walking, walking. Walking is the best possible exercise and, uh, and integrate the key supplements into, into, your, into your life and open your heart to others. If we open our heart to others, people we agree with, people we don't agree with, then we connect with the capacity of our heart to transform whatever it, it gets, it accepts and it transforms. I love it. Great advice. And again, everybody, I just, you know, this is just great wisdom too. I love Dr. Isaac's heart here too. And what he shared is that our emotional health is just as important, if not more than what we're eating on a daily basis. And also he talked about, listen, uh, you know, studies can be important. It's important to look at studies, but remember we have thousands and thousands of years of ancient history of people that had great wisdom doing a mil, you know, these people combined 
over a million individual case studies to find the power of medicinal mushrooms, the power of pectin, the power of using herbs like medicine, like astragalus and some of the and reishi and these things we talked about. So I just want to say, I mean, I, I love Dr. Isaac. He's uh, you know a person that we have a lot of people on the show, but again, I, I know your depth of knowledge and understanding how to get to the root cause and heal people is something I just respect so greatly. So I want to encourage you guys, visit drelias.org. And, uh, you know, check out all the articles he's written. They're fantastic. I want to say, Dr. Isaac, hey, I respect you. I want to let you know I'm so appreciative of you coming on the show. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. This podcast is for information purposes only. Statements and views expressed in this podcast are not medical advice and have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. In some cases, individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest in products or services referred to herein.